Luke chapter 6. <clears throat> and it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first, that he went through the cornfields, and his disciples plucked the ears of corn, the wheat, not corn as you think of on the cob or popcorn, and did eat, rubbing them, rubbing the, them in their hands. You got to break off the chaff, and then you get the, the grain. And certain of the Pharisees, dum 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 dum, said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day? Where? Where is this a law that you can't break up out of chaff from the wheat? And yet the work because they said they didn't pick up sticks to make fire. Yeah, this is not yeah, it's true, but this is not really working. Or pick up the manna on the Sabbath yep. day. But these Pharisees are just taking overboard. Because in the law, you could eat um, your neighbor's grapes and all that. You just couldn't take any extra with you. I mean, you figure you just take a piece of grain and you put it between your two fingers. It's work, but it's not really work. They're looking to get Jesus. And certain Pharisees said, and why do you eat which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Because well, look what Jesus does. And Jesus answer, answering them said, have ye not read? So much as this, when David did, when he, when himself was hung, uh, hungered, and they which were with him, how he went into the house of God, and did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. Ooh, look at that. He went over the, the Sabbath. He went right into the holy place. I believe this is 1 Samuel 21. You guys are so worried about the little grain on the Sabbath. What about the fact is that King David went and had showbread? Now David is of the priest class. David was allowed to do priestly functions that Asa tried to do and failed. That Saul, Saul tried to do and failed. David is one of them prophet, priests, and kings, but, you know, you lift up David and look what he did. They ate the, sh the old showbread, because it wasn't the new one. That wasn't for him to eat. He said that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Hey, you know what? I'm God. I'm allowing him to do it, okay? You got a problem with that? Go speak to my father. You may, you know... He, Little boy, you know, one of the things, you know, I'm, you know, you get into, I'm gonna go tell my father. <laughs> you know, Jesus said, Hey, you, you want to take this up with my father? No, I don't mean Joseph. You want to take it up with my father in this? Because you and I will have it out before my dad. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered, dried up unusable and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him wait a minute wait a minute it's church service and they're going to watch Jesus not for worship to watch to see what he's going to do so their heart is not in the service they're wanting to find out what Jesus is going to do in the service. So God is completely out of their life. In the church service. And you can sit in a church service and not be there for worship. Here it is. Whether he would heal on the Sabbath day. That they might find accusation against him. Boys, want to go to church? Yeah, let's go to church. What are we going to church for? That we may catch Jesus at doing something wrong. Write that one off the books of God's books. That, that verse is, uh, 1 Samuel 21, 5, yeah, 1 Samuel 21. So, someone can go to church and not be there to worship God. So, don't look around in your church. Oh, everybody here is saved. It's not true. It's not right. Not everybody has the mind of God when they go into the church. There may be other motives. And I could I could list you. Being saved since 1987, the churches that I've been in, I can tell you. 
but he knew their thoughts. Deity. God knows your thoughts. He answers the, their thoughts without saying a word. And the, the, the people saying a word. He answers the thought. How can you say Jesus is not God? If Jesus is not God, then he's a glorifier mind reader. 100% of the time. I may be able to read someone's mind about something, but not all the time. And said to the man which had the withered hand, Come back Monday morning, I'll take care of you. Make an appointment with my secretary. That's what the Pharisees wanted him to do. Rise up. And stand forth in the midst. He's going to put this guy, him and Jesus, together in the middle of everybody. People think Jesus is a wimpy, timpy kind of, tippy-toe kind of. Hey, these people are here. They're, they're going to get me. Come here. Stand up. Let's get in the middle of everybody here. I want everybody to see what I'm going to do. I want witnesses. And he rose and stood forth. Guy's obedient. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? Now in Mark 3, destroy is replaced with kill. And looking around about them all, Mark 3 says, with anger. Put all four Gospels together and you get a great story. He is angry in this church service. He said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. It's withered. God will have us sometimes to do impossibility, impossibility that we can't do, that only God can do. Mary, you're going to have a baby, but I, I don't know any man. That's okay. We'll take care of it. We'll take care of that. And he did so. And his hand was restored whole as the other. Time of rejoicing. And they were filled with in madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. The Pharisees and the scribes are finished with God. Now you got Joseph and Arameus, you got Nicodemus, a few of them, Paul later. But as a group, not in, outside individuals, they're done. They did not rejoice with this man. It's a Sabbath day. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into the mountain to pray. And he gets off by himself again. And continued all night in prayer to God. Sweet hour of prayer? Well, how about sweet six hours in prayer? All night. 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Can you do that? Have you ever done that? I haven't. Have you ever given up a night's sleep? What would Jesus have to pray? It would have to be for others, for the nation, for the people. For his, he, Jesus didn't need prayer for himself. He spent six hours in prayer for others. And the path that he's going to Calvary. Now, if God needed to pray six hours, guess what? I do not pray enough in my life. Never have and never will. And if you ever catch me boasting in my prayer life, you come up and smack me in the face. And you go and show me this Bible verse that says that Jesus prayed for six hours. Oh, okay, I can pray during six hours. Losing sleep. And then picking back up in the morning doing his job. Oh. Jesus got us beat. 
give up a night's sleep and still go to work the next morning in prayer and probably fasting I don't think he took along with him a Twinkie in a lunchbox people write these books about prayer and they speak about oh we're great prayer in church no you're not because if you are such I, listen I'm preaching to myself if I was such a good prayer miser how come I can go within five miles of this place and still find a package store Why do I get a sexual pervert living down the end of my street if I'm such a good prayer warrior? I'm not. I ought to be ashamed of myself. And you know what? I don't know how to pray. And I'm not going to get a book. I'm not going to buy a secular book. I'm just going to look at the Bible and see that Jesus prayed all night six hours. I had never even reached that point in my life. When it was day, 6 a.m., he called unto him his disciples. Of them he chose twelve, whom he named apostles. Whom, excuse me, Simon, who he also named Peter. So all the popes changed their names. And Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew, and I don't know if these orders, because these names are given in different orders. I don't know what order they're given in. Matthew. And just looking for a note here. Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zolotes. That's an extra one there. And these names, these names will not match Matthew, Mark. They may have three names, as Americans have three names. They may be called by another name. It's no contradiction. Now watch this. Judas, the brother of James. In Matthew 10, this is Labedius. Third name, that is, Mark 3. And Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. Jesus 12 had two Judases and there was a Simon called Peter and I believe Judas was also a son of Simon and you have Simon called Herodias. These names are really messed up when you study them. And he came down with them and stood in the plain. So now he comes down off the mountain. And a company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon. Man, they're coming from north, east, south, west. And what does the last chapter of Mark tell us to do? You go to them. Why? Because the healing and all that's going to disappear. They're coming to Jesus because he's feeding them. He's taking care of them. He's healing them. He's got good words which came to hear him and to be healed of their disease. See, we come to hear, hear him, then we want to be healed. There's a lot of churches out there that they go because the church is doing something for them, feeding them, giving them sensation of the flesh of the music they're, they're listening to. Shelter. Don't think just because you got a great masses in your church, you're right. And they were, and they that were vexed with unclean spirits, they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. So see, they, they're coming to Jesus to be healed. So what do you see in 2016? These faith healers, they come to the preacher to be healed. Yeah, but you can't heal them. And you're not Jesus. You're not an apostle. Now Luke is the son of man. This is the Sermon on the Mount of Matthew 6 and 7. That is of a king. Matthew's Sermon on the Mount is of a king. Luke's Sermon on the Mount is the son of man. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, on his disciples. 
and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So all poor people are going to get the kingdom of God. I don't think so. Scripture where scripture says no, because if you're a poor, wicked, evil man, you're not going to get nothing. In Matthew it says heaven. So guess what's going to happen in the millennium? You got both the kingdom of God, spiritual, and you got the kingdom of heaven, physical. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Context. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. How about in hell, where it says weeping and gnashing of teeth? Contents. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you. You know anybody that hates, is hated by somebody and not because they're a Christian? Would you, how would you like to apply this Jewish verse here to Adolf Hitler? Blessed you, Adolf Hitler, for all the Jews hate you. Uh, excuse me, you think you can take that in context? How about a man that would be married to a woman in this village or, and he just beats his children, beats his wife and abuses her and takes the money and uses it for his own blood? You think, oh, we hate that guy. You think, oh, God, is it? No. See, contents. And when they shall separate you from, from their company. Separation is a Bible doctrine, whether you want to believe it or not. And if you live godly, they will live they will they will leave you now if you got people hanging around you who don't love the Lord and all that you need to check your thermometer you're not living high with God and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake for Jesus Christ you ought to be you ought to be separated from people even Christians will separate themselves from you rejoice in that day and leap for joy for behold your reward is great in heaven for in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets the prophets were mistreated the disciples the apostles will be mistreated and then when Peter and John are whipped and axed, man, they're rejoicing. They're glorifying God. They're, they're, man, their butt is red, but they're happy. But woe unto you that are rich. You better take this up with the book of James. We're talking about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. We're talking to Jewish people. And there's one, only one period of time that it you ought not be rich. A rich man could get saved today. J.C. Penney was a rich, saved man. In the tribulation period, if you're rich, you're doomed. You got the mark. Nothing else. I'm going against the grain right now of teaching, but I'm going Bible with Bible in context. Woe unto you that are rich. Then Jesus already tells his disciples, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man enter the kingdom. But Lord, who can? With God, all things are possible. A rich man can get saved. But in the tribulation period, he receives that mark and becomes rich. He's damned. Woe unto you that are rich, for ye have received your consolation. You got it now. That rich man ends up in hell. You had it all. You had the food, you had the comfort, you had the gates. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. Verses 24, 25, and maybe 26. These are not found in Matthew. Luke added to the word of God. Ooh. No, the Holy Spirit said, Luke, write this. Matthew, don't. Remember, Luke is writing to a Gentile about the testimony of Jesus Christ. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you.
that's a sign that you're not living right. And so did their fathers to the false prophets. To the false prophets. They gave them titles. They gave them uh, honorary degrees. They gave them a little piece of the paper they could hang up in their church. They became ambassadors of the cities. They became famous. But I say unto you, which hear, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them which dis despitefully use you. Doesn't look like the Christian life of the apostles is going to be easy, does it? He's preparing them for acts. He's preaching to the disciples because what people in Israel are going to be going through all this? Only those that get saved. This is not for the Democratic Party of the United States of America. And unto him that smiteth thee on the, on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy coat, forbid not to take thy coat also. Well, who practices that part? Law courts are filled in America. They should not be. If you want to follow the Sermon on the Mount, okay, well, you want to sue me for a thousand? Here's two thousand. That don't happen. Come on, just give up those emails. Sorry. Give to every man that asketh of thee. Even I don't do that. I will weigh you out. If I'm going to give you any money, I'm going to make sure that the money is worthy to be given to you. And of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. Your neighbor asks for your lawnmower because his broke down. He never returns it. Don't go knocking on his door and say, Can I you go buy yourself a new lawnmower. Let's see that one being practiced in the Baptist church, okay? I'm guilty. I stand guilty in front of Jesus Christ. And so are these 12 disciples of the Lamb. They don't think they're guilty. And as ye would that men should do to you, uh oh, here's a golden rule, do ye also to them likewise. For if you love them which love you, what thank, what thank ye have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. If ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank ye have ye? For sinners also do even the same. If ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what think have ye? Put that on a bank. For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much. Put that on the front doors of a bank. We're only going to lend to sinners. Because we're sinners. You know, we'll charge you 22% on your loan and give, give you only 1.3% on your savings. But love your enemies. And do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. Your reward shall be great. And you shall be the children of the highest. For ye, he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. For I've heard many stories from preachers that got burned giving money. You want to live on the Sermon Amount? Don't complain. You want to put this to the church? Don't complain. Well, I'm not going to do that again. If you want to apply this to the church, you have to do it again. See, these are all works. I'm not judging if a guy comes up and he says, can I borrow 20 bucks? No. That's not my salvation. This is before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What's he telling them to do? Do good. Be good. Your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father is also, also is merciful. Luke writes in such a way, some of these words you really got to look at. Uh-oh. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. 
condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. The subject we've been talking about is God in you. He said in verse 35, But love ye your enemies, and do good, lending and hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. And ye shall be called the children of the capital H highest, for he, God, is kind unto all the unthankful and to the, to the evil. Be therefore merciful as your father is also merciful. Judge not. See, it's, the last verses have been about God. And your attitude to other people. Now don't judge that person because his hair is purple. But judge that person say, you know what? I don't think that person's saved. I need to deal with him as a lost man. Or I have a, th I have a thing that person is saved and he needs to grow up in the Lord. I can judge those things. But to judge you because you got a cigarette hanging out your mouth. Well, the Lord will say, well, about that time when you had a cigarette hanging out your mouth all those years, buddy. I seen it taking care of you during that time, didn't I? Now, I, you got to be careful here. Because you cannot say you cannot completely judge. The hospital would be full if you did not completely judge. Let's say, if I take these scissors, I don't think I should put them, not, I don't think I should put those in the light socket. Nah, judge not, you should be, bleh. oh, gee, what happened? Pills, take one every day. Ah, oh, man, come on. <coughs> How about this? How about a guy, he likes this woman, and she's a prostitute. Oh dear, I want to marry you and be your. And then he questions why she's sleeping around on him. You got to judge. You go to a car dealer. The only thing holding this car together is spit and duct tape. Oh, I can't judge you, buddy. I'll buy the car. No, you got to take that car to a, to another person who knows what they're doing. You got to listen to people. You got to hey, listen. You know what? This car, I. I I've seen it at the mechanic shop a lot. This car, uh, somebody's had, and it's got these problems. You got to listen. That's judging. And if you don't do that in your life, I'm going to park in this for a little while. If you don't do that, then you're stupid. You're a fool. But see, what the people are saying when they come up to you on the street and you preach and judge, not, they don't want to be condemned before God because they know they are condemned before God. I grew up in a generation that's that's disappearing. When I first started smoking, I hid. And when somebody brought it out to my parents, I smoked. Oh, I was mad. How dare you tell them? Who is that? And that's exactly what they're doing. They don't want to be condemned before God, especially in the public. But when they come up to you and judge not least you to be judged, you need to pray for them because the Holy Spirit is working on their heart. Holy Spirit's tap and say, you know what? That guy's talking about you. Oh, 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 how dare you? Yes. That's someone who needs prayer. Not to get back in their face angrily. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Really? You, come on, I'm not saying the Bible's wrong, but have you ever given to somebody and, and got back to you? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and run over, running over. I have no idea. Shall men give unto your bosom? Go talk to Paul. Demons has forsaken me. These guys have gone off in the ministry. I'm here all by myself. Only Luke is with me. You bring my parchments if you, you know when you come into. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured. To you now that's a scary verse don't be go quote and judge not least you be judged and you don't quote Luke 38 
If I deal with someone unmercifully, God's going to deal with me unmercifully. If I treat my wife like crap, I better not complain when my boss treats me like... Oh, I almost swore there. Ooh. When my boss treats me like doo-doo. If I'm mean and nasty to people, I better not expect people to be nice to me. And then blame God when, when they're not. Now, if I try to help people, I try to do right, God will put a little more effort into others for you. Be not deceived, God's not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. And that's what we're talking about right here. I try to do, I try to teach people fairly. That's why I don't blow up on the streets. Because I don't want God blowing up at me. And then when these people get in your face, realize what you just did to me, God will get you. And you're going to probably get upset and blow your mind. And then you're going to realize one day, I hope at the judgment seat of Christ, I hope not the great white throne judge. Listen, when I'm talking about the street ministry, we're there because we love you. They tell, you lack love. You lack love. No, I don't. I'm trying to tell you that you're, you're going down a road where the bridge is out. And you can't cross. And when you come to that bridge, you fall. I want you to build Christ as your bridge. I love you. Satan has no love. He'll do anything he can to damn your soul. And when I tell you about God is going to judge me. I don't know how, but for telling you what God expects from you. And he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Back then, no. Today they got walking sticks. They got dogs. Men do things to try to prove the Bible wrong. But a blind man in himself and another blind man, no. They can't. Shall they not both fall into the ditch? I was just telling my wife yesterday, I was going to work and it was an accident. I see here in Florida, a lot of cars ended up in ditches. They're blind when they use their cell phones. They're blind when they got their, their booze. Now, I understand it could be medical conditions. I don't know. But when you go down the road and you got your cell phone, you're blind. You can't see. The disciple is not above his master. Who would be the disciples' master? Jesus. Master. Isn't that what the title we saw in Mark? For everyone that is perfect, that's not perfect, I mean, you're you, you doing to the best of your ability. Oh, but you sinned. Yeah, I sinned, but you know, the best of my ability shall be as his master. I can be as Jesus. I can't be Jesus, but I can be as Jesus. Press that mark. Why behold the mote that's in thy brother's eye, but perceive not the beam that's in thy own eye? You know, mote, little tiny thing, beam, telephone pole. Peter, how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother? Let me pull out the mote that's in thine eye. When thou therefore beholdest not the beam that's in thy own eye. Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam that's in thy own eye. Then shalt thou be, see clearly to pull out the mote that's in thy brother's eye. Now that again, that verse is, is used out of context. Again, the, the public ministry. Ask my wife, I read and study the Bible and pray. Not as much as I should. I'm a sinner. I do things wrong. I'm not a perfect husband. I'm not a perfect uh, father. I'm not a perfect employee. Never profess to be. I'm not. But God has given me enough insight that if I can come to you with a Bible and show you where you need to change, 
You need to listen. As much as somebody came to me with a Bible and said, you know, you got this in your life, you need to change. It's not completely not, hey, oh, I can't look at other people's lives and because, you know, there's sometimes you got to walk up to somebody and say, you know, you got a little spaghetti sauce in your face. What are you going to do? Let them walk around with it? You don't want them to look bad. You don't want them to be bad. If you love them correctly, the way the Bible says love, you, you will try to help, but you just also just keep your own business. Important verse in verses 43. For a good tree bringeth not, bringeth not forth corrupt fruit. Neither does a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So my question is for you. What kind of tree are you? What are your fruit around you? Every tree has some kind of fruit. And they may not be something you can pick. Some trees the fruit is firewood. Some trees you can't use as firewood. It don't burn or it burns as a smoky. Some fruits you can go up, pick, and eat. I forget which one. There's a nut that if you pick, you can't touch with your hands or something. Cashew or something like that. You you can't pick. You got. I don't know. There are some fruits. And if you walk up to a tree and you eat, you're going to get sick, or you may die. Everybody has fruit, including Satan. Now you look around my tree. I've got good fruit. I've also got bad fruit. I got corrupt fruit around me. And according to this verse here, that's wrong. And when those fruits fall down to the ground, inside those fruits there are seeds. And around my around my tree, I hope I got good fruit. I hope maybe I got another apple tree growing somewhere. Maybe a pear tree. I don't know. I'm just trying to give you an illustration. But I've also got weeds and I've got tares growing around my tree because of the fruit of corruption I produce. You got to look at yourself as the Bible looks at some. And it's illustrated. Men are like trees in the Bible. You got to look at yourself and what am I producing? If Jesus were come to me as a fig tree, would he find fruit? Jeremiah, what do you see? I see figs. I see good figs. I see naughty figs. Are you naughty? I'm not perfect. I've got bad fruit around me because of me. But I hope I got more good fruit than I have bad fruit. And you got to be careful when you grow bad fruit because weeds overpower the good. My wife went away, come back, the plants are dead. They weren't cared for. But oh, there's weeds in there now. There are weeds, that, there are plants that she did not plant in there that are growing fine. But the good plant is dead. It takes hard work to get your good fruit going. And John says that God goes in there and he prunes us. And it hurts. To be cut. And you know he's pruning he's pruning that bad fruit off the tree. God's merciful to something, you know, oh I see that bad fruit. Lord God, I am so sorry, man. Please put that in the blood of the Lord Jesus. And he gets this clippers and come it's gone. But the fruit I don't put under the blood drops to the ground, it decays, the seed goes in the ground, and it produces a plant. And that plant may be ugly around my tree. That plant may disease the tree. That plant may overpower and grow up another little tree. There are sins in my life that, that perverted my son as a, as a plant. And there's nothing I can do about it now. The seed has taken its spot, it's grown, and it's praise God with the mercy of God. But we've all got fruit around us. And some of our fruit may make people sick or it may make them full. For every tree is known by his own fruit. What do they people know you as?
For of thorns men do gather figs. I assume that a fig tree has thorns. I, nor a bramble bush gather they grapes. Okay, for thorns men do not gather. A thorn and bramble are weeds. They don't belong with figs. They don't belong with grapes. And we read about the parable of the sower. Guess what some of the stuff that came up and choked the word? Thorns and thistles. A good man out of good treasure of his heart bringing forth that which is good. An evil man out of evil treasure out of evil treasure of his heart bringing forth that which is evil. For out of abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Now see a man that's good in his heart he can bring good. But because he's good is he saved? Just because he gives to the United Way, just because he, he gives to the, to the the food house before, you know, he helps the poor, he helps. That's not salvation. You can have good fruit and not be saved. John the Baptist said, you know, about fruit with the trees on that, the axe is laid to the roots. Men are liking trees. Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Well, I'm a Christian. We hear that all the time. I'm a Christian. Really? And you're bad mouthing what we're doing, the Bible tells us, and you're a Christian. Don't say you're a Christian. Because you ought to be doing what we're doing. You ought to come up to this and say, hey, I enjoy what you're doing. You know, we go knock on the doors, or we pass out gospel, to, or we talk about the gospel to somebody. I like how you're doing what you're doing. We very rarely get those. Yeah. We go over here and we pass out tracks of this, but well, thank you guys for taking us in. Yeah. Don't come to me and say, Lord, Lord, and we, we don't like what you're doing. Whosoever. Whosoever cometh to me, and heareth my sayings, and doeth them, will I show you to whom he is like. He is like a man that buildeth a house, and diggeth deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the floods rose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. How's that a verse for anxiety? And fears you build your house upon a rock and guess what the storms will come when you stand in the judgment seat of Christ he'll stand but he that heareth and doeth not now these are the people who go run and occupy the pastor's time pastor my marriage is ruined pastor my life is ruined pastor, I can't is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth. Dirt. Against when which the streams did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Why? Because he didn't do and apply what the word of God told him to do. And James says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. You want a strong foundation? Do what God's told you to do. Now, all they that live godly shall suffer persecution. I ain't telling you life's going to be hunky dory Read Paul. But in all those troubles, you can have a sure foundation where Paul, at the end of his life, said, I have fought the good fight. Why? Because Christian life is fighting. That's why God's given us armor. Some Christians think that armor is to take to the to the thrift store, the pawn shop, and sell and get little pleasures, and it's not. I like my wife. That that's her life first, the armor of God. My life first is looking for the blessed hope of Jesus. Get dressed in the Lord and wait. Here we go. 